What if you could view the world from a new perspective? Explore the line between truth and fiction. You are listening to the Illumination Hour with your host, Ellen Stallone. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Illumination Hour. I hope you're all enjoying your 2017 so far. I sure am. Uh, And I have some big changes coming up very soon in the future. Tomorrow, actually. I'm starting classes full-time again, which means I will have a very limited amount of time. And unfortunately, that means that I'm going to have to take a hiatus from this show. That's right, this is going to be the last episode for the next few months, at the very least. There's some major changes going on in my life, and I hope all of my listeners understand that. When I have more obligations and responsibilities that take up so much of my time, it's hard to set aside you know, the, the amount of time and effort that it takes for me to produce this show. Because I do all of the recording and the editing on my own, so it's it's pretty time-consuming. You know, it takes me at l- somewhere between 9 and 15 hours to make even one of these shows. And I know that that is just going to be an obscene amount of time for me to sink into this when it comes to taking all of the classes that I'm going to be taking. And it's not like, you know, I'm just going to take an art or an English class. I'm going to be taking things like calculus 2, differential equations, chemical engineering, statistics. So it's it's pretty difficult stuff. And I hope you all can understand that that's going to mean that I don't have time for this. And it's not that I don't want to do this. I'm certainly going to come back with a season 2 of the Illumination Hour So be looking for that in the near future. But, you know, this is one of the prices that you have to pay for pursuing your goals and interests, is not having as much time for other things that you might enjoy. So today's show is going to be about childhood development, and I've been thinking about this uh, for some time recently, because there are things that happen when you're a child that still affect you as an adult, especially if those things that happened were traumatic or upsetting in some way. Uh, And as we'll see in this episode, if a child doesn't complete one of these stages of development totally or without any issues, then there are residual effects that carry on into adulthood. Most of these stages of development are highly disputed, especially when it comes to the stages of development as described by Freud. But we will be going over more than just Freud's stages of development. We'll also be covering Eric Erikson and Piaget. So we'll be getting some variety of viewpoints and hopefully touching on some amount of truth. Whenever you hear a theory, or an idea, there's usually three options that you can take with it. There's the thesis, the basic thesis that you hear. Uh, There's the antithesis, which is the complete opposite. And then there's the synthesis, which tends to hold the most truth, or at least be more level-headed than the thesis or the antithesis. Because it takes aspects of both, and usually the truth is not completely one-sided or hit upon completely within the first theory or thesis. And this is true for just about any issue that you might be dealing with. For example, 9-11. We all know the crazy conspiracy theories and the official story. The official story states that There were planes that were flown by Al-Qaeda members directly into the Twin Towers for the purposes of terrorism. 
Now, the antithesis to that would be that the government planned the flight, or perhaps there weren't even any planes that hit the Twin Towers at all. And this antithesis was created because people have no trust in the official statement of the government, because we all know that sometimes the government does not tell the truth. But the synthesis of these ideas is somewhere in between. You know, maybe there was a terrorist organization or a few individuals that were radical and trying to commit an act of terrorism, but the government didn't tell the entire truth about this story. Maybe there are facts and backroom meetings that we don't know about. So it usually is wise to take a middle-of-the-road approach just because some things we can't know the entire truth of because there are hidden facts or things that we can't objectively quantify. If we had all of the facts, if we had the objective truth in everything, then we could form a truthful thesis. But sometimes that's just not possible. And especially when it comes to a soft science like psychology, It's hard to know exactly what the truth is, because we're all different individuals. So these developmental theories are somewhere along the lines of truth, but again, we can't really know how true they are depending on the individual that we're analyzing. And each researcher, of course, had their own biases and independent viewpoints, so Just keep that in mind when we're analyzing all of these developmental stages. So, of course, we're going to talk about Freud first, because he was the pioneer of all of these stages. He was the person who invented the idea of psychosexual or any sort of developmental theory. And being the first, of course, there's always a lot of unknowns that he was dealing with, and a lot of conjecture. So... Keep that in mind when we're discussing this. But Freud's psychosexual theory of development suggests that children develop through a series of stages related to erogenous zones. Freud was a Viennese physician who developed his theory of development through his work with emotionally troubled adults. So he didn't actually deal with children. He was talking with adults who were recalling events from their childhood. So he may have even invented or pushed some of his viewpoints onto them, but we don't really know. He began his research into the workings of the human mind in 1881, after a century during which Europe and America saw the reform of the insane asylum and an ever-increasing interest in abnormal psychological states, especially the issue of nervous diseases, which was the first phenomena that Freud studied examining the nervous system of fish while gaining his medical degree at the University of Vienna. Freud turned to the issue of psychology after reading in 1884 about Brewer's treatment of hysteria by hypnosis, and after studying under Charcot at the Sorbonne in 1885. He faced opposition and even ridicule for many of his ideas until a group of young doctors began to follow him to Vienna in 1902 leading to the creation of the Viennese Psychoanalytic Society, and then later in 1910, the formation of the International Psychoanalytic Association. Now it's considered controversial and largely outdated, but his theory is based on the idea that parents play a crucial role in managing their children's sexual and aggressive drives during the first few years of life, in order to foster their proper development. Although he often distinguished his ideas from medicine or biology, Freud was especially interested in establishing a scientific basis for his theories, so he often turned to biological models in order to underline the empirical basis for what were, by necessity, subjective interpretations of apparently illogical and certainly multivalent symbols. For example, his analysis of dreams which we can't say are objective in any way. They're all subjective. But he was the first to attempt to analyze the symbols that are contained within our dreams. In introductory lectures on psychoanalysis, 
Freud confesses of the difficulties faced by a psychoanalytical critic at the turn of the 20th century. No empirical evidence, a reliance on the spoken word because of the talking cure, the extremely personal nature of sexual drives, which are sometimes barbaric, and therefore resist exposure, hence the notion of the unconscious, and civilization's natural antipathy to the revelation of the instinctive pleasures that we continually sacrifice for the common good. Despite these caveats, Freud was, indeed, drawn by scientific models for his theories. Although Freud's main concern was the sexual desire, he understood desire in terms of formative drives, instincts or appetites, that naturally determined one's behaviors and beliefs even as we continually repress those behaviors and beliefs. As a young student in Vienna, Freud was, in fact, especially fascinated by Charles Darwin's theories of evolution. So, following a biological logic, if you will, Freud therefore established a rigid model for the normal sexual development of the human subject, which is what he terms libido. Here, then, is your story, as told by Freud, with the ages provided as very rough approximations, since Freud often changed his mind about the actual dates of the various stages, and also acknowledged that development varied between individuals. Stages can even overlap or be experienced simultaneously. Freud believed that the human personality consisted of three interworking parts, the id, the ego, and the superego. According to his theory, these parts became unified as a child works through the five stages of psychosexual development. The id, the largest part of the mind, is related to desires and impulses, and it is the main source of basic biological needs. The ego is related to reasoning and is the conscious, rational part of the personality. It monitors behavior in order to satisfy basic desires without suffering negative consequences. The superego, or conscience, develops through interaction with others, mainly parents, who want the child to conform to the norms of society. The superego restricts the desires of the id by applying norms and values from society. Freud believed that a struggle existed between these levels of consciousness— influencing personality development and psychopathology. For Freud, childhood experiences shape our personalities and behavior as adults. He viewed development as discontinuous. He believed that each of us must pass through a series of stages during childhood, and that if any of us lack proper nurturing or parenting during a stage, we might become stuck or fixated on that stage. According to Freud, child's pleasure-seeking urges, governed by the id, are focused on a different area of the body, called an erogenous zone, at each of the five stages of development. So from zero to two years of age is the first psychosexual stage of development. During this stage, the mouth is the pleasure center for the child's development. Freud believed this is why infants are born with a sucking reflex and desire their mother's breast. If a child's oral needs are not met during infancy, they may develop negative habits such as nail-biting or thumb-sucking to meet this basic need. Early in your development, all of your desires were oriented towards your lips and your mouth, which accepted food, milk, or anything else you could get your hands on. The first object of this stage was, of course, the mother's breast, which could be transferred to autoerotic objects, such as thumb-sucking. The mother thus logically became your first love object, already a displacement from the earlier object of desire. When you first recognized the fact of your father, you dealt with him by identifying yourself with him. However, as the sexual wishes directed to your mother grew in intensity. You became possessive of your mother and secretly wished that your father was out of the picture. This is known as the Oedipus Complex. So the Oedipus Complex plays out throughout the next two phases of development. 
This next stage occurs somewhere between the ages of two to four years of age, and is called the anal phase. Sometimes this is called the sadistic anal phase. During this stage, toddlers and preschool age children begin to experiment with urine and feces. Not exactly in test tubes and pipettes, but in other ways. The control they learn to exert over their bodily functions is manifested in toilet training. Improper resolution of this stage, such as parents toilet training their children too early, can result in a child who's uptight or overly obsessed with order. It's split between active and passive impulses. The impulse to mastery, on the one hand, which can easily become cruelty. The impulse to scopophilia, which is the love of gazing, on the other hand. This vase was roughly coterminous with a new autoerotic object, the rectal orifice, hence the term sadistic anal phase. According to Freud, the child's pleasure in defecation is connected to his or her pleasure in creating something of his or her own, a pleasure that for women is later transferred to childbearing. The next stage, which is phallic, is generally from three to six years of age. During this stage, preschoolers take pleasure in their genitals and, according to Freud, begin to struggle with sexual desires towards the opposite sex parent, boys to mothers and girls to fathers. For boys, this is called the Oedipus Complex, involving a boy's desire for his mother and his urge to replace his father who's seen as a rival for the mother's attention. At the same time, the boy is afraid his father will punish him for his feelings, so he experiences castration anxiety. The Electra Complex, later proposed by Freud's protege Carl Jung, involves a girl's desire for her father's attention and wish to take her mother's place. We enter the phallic phase, when the penis, or the clitoris, becomes your primary object. The clitoris, according to Freud, stands for the penis in the young girl, which is where the accusation of being sexist comes from. In this stage, the child becomes fascinated with urination, which is experienced as pleasurable, both in its expulsion and retention. The trauma connected with this phase is that of castration, which makes this phase especially important for the resolution of the Oedipus complex. Over this time, you begin to deal with your separation anxieties and your all-encompassing egoism by finding symbolic ways of representing and thus controlling the separation from, not to mention the desire for, your mother. You also learn to defer bodily gratification when necessary. In other words, your ego became trained to follow the reality principle and to control the pleasure principle, although this ability would not be fully attained until you pass through the latency period. In resolving the Oedipus complex, you also begin to identify either with your mother or your father, thus determining the future path of your sexual orientation. That identification took the form of an ego ideal, which then aided the formation of your superego, an internalization of the parental function, which Freud usually associated with the father, that eventually manifested itself in your conscience and sense of guilt. Next, we enter the latency period, which is somewhere between 6 and 12 years of age. During this stage, sexual instincts subside, and children begin to further develop the superego, or the conscience. Children begin to behave in morally acceptable ways and adopt the values of their parents and other important adults. The latency period is the longest period during which the sexual development was more or less suspended, and... You concentrated on repressing or sublimating your earlier desires, and thus learned to follow the reality principle. During this phase, you gradually freed yourself from your parents, moving away from the mother and reconciling yourself with your father, or by asserting your independence. If you responded to your incestuous desires by becoming overly subservient to your father... 
You also moved beyond your childhood egoism and sacrificed something of your own ego to others, thus learning how to love others. The final stage is the genital age, which is generally from 12 and beyond. During this stage, sexual impulses reemerge. If other stages have been successfully met, adolescents engage in appropriate sexual behavior, which may lead to marriage or childbirth. Your development over the latency period allowed you to enter the genital phase, which, at this point, you learn to desire members of the opposite sex and to fulfill your instinct to procreate, and thus ensure the survival of the human species. Which we all know is the most important responsibility that each one of us carries. I'm just kidding, I don't really believe that. I don't think you have any responsibility to the human species to give birth to children, only if you want to. But Freud's theory is, of course, interesting, and I wonder if a lot of his developmental theories were based on people who were expressing things that were not entirely healthy. Certainly, young children have obsessions with going to the bathroom or putting things in their mouth, but does that really indicate a psychosexual development? Do children even have sexual desires? Well, surely we're all born with instincts, but they don't necessarily represent themselves in the same way that Freud is asserting that they do. But anyway, that is Freud's basic theory, and we'll keep that in mind as we cover the next two psychologists with their developmental theories. Our next contender in psychosexual development is Eric Erickson. He proposed a psychoanalytic theory of psychosocial development, comprising eight stages from infancy to adulthood. Notice Eric Erickson's focus is more so on psychosocial development and not exactly on psychosexual. During each stage, the person experiences a psychosocial crisis, which could have a positive or negative outcome for personality development. Erickson's ideas were greatly influenced by Freud, going along with Freud's theory regarding the structure and topography of personality. However, where Freud was an id psychologist, Erickson was an ego psychologist. He emphasized the role of culture and society, and the conflicts that can take place within the ego itself, whereas Freud emphasized the conflict between the ego and the superego. According to Erickson, the ego develops as it successfully resolves crises that are distinctly social in nature. These involve establishing a sense of trust in others, developing a sense of identity in society, and helping the next generation prepare for the future. Erickson extends on Freud's thoughts by focusing on the adaptive and creative characteristic of the ego, and expanding the notion of the stages of personality development to include the entire lifespan. Like Freud and many others, Eric Erickson maintained that personality develops in a predetermined order, and builds upon each previous stage. This is called the epigenic principle. The outcome of this maturation timetable is a wide and integrated set of life skills and abilities that function together within the autonomous individual. However, instead of focusing on sexual development like Freud, he was interested in how children socialize and how this affects their sense of self. Erickson's theory of psychosocial development was developed in 1959 and has eight stages that are distinct, taking in five stages up to the age of 18 years and three further stages beyond, well into adulthood. Erickson suggests that there is still plenty of room for continued growth and development throughout one's life. Erickson puts a great deal of emphasis on the adolescent period, feeling it was a crucial stage for developing a person's identity. Similar to Freud, Erickson assumes that a crisis occurs at each stage of development. For Erickson, 
These crises are of psychological nature because they involve psychological needs of the individual conflicting with the needs of society. According to the theory, successful completion of each stage results in a healthy personality and acquisition of basic virtues. Basic virtues are characteristic strengths which the ego can use to resolve subsequent crises. Failure to successfully complete a stage can result in a reduced ability to complete further stages, and therefore a more unhealthy personality or sense of self. These stages, however, can be resolved successfully at a later time. The first stage is trust versus mistrust. Is the world a safe place, or is it full of unpredictable events and accidents waiting to happen? Erickson's first psychosocial crisis occurs during the first year or so of life, like Freud's oral stage of psychosexual development. The crisis is one of trust versus mistrust. During this stage, the infant is uncertain about the world in which they live. To resolve these feelings of uncertainty, the infant looks towards their primary caregiver for stability and consistency of care. If the care the infant receives is consistent, predictable, and reliable, they will develop a sense of trust which will carry them through other relationships, and they will be able to feel secure, even when threatened. Success in this stage will lead to the virtue of hope. By developing a sense of trust, the infant can have hope that as new crises arise, there's a real possibility that other people will be there and are a source of support. Failing to acquire the virtue of hope will lead to the development of fear. For example, if the care has been harsh or inconsistent, unpredictable or unreliable, then the infant will develop a sense of mistrust and will not have confidence in the world around them or their ability to influence events. This infant will carry the basic sense of mistrust with them to other relationships, it may result in anxiety, heightened insecurities, or a feeling of mistrust in the world around them. Consistent with Erickson's views on the importance of trust, research by Bowlby and Ainsworth has outlined how the quality of the early experience of attachment can affect relationships with others in later life. The second stage is autonomy versus shame and doubt. The child is developing physically and becoming more mobile. Between the ages of 18 months and 3, children begin to assert their independence by walking away from their mother, playing with toys or picking toys to play with, and making choices about what they like to wear or to eat. The child is discovering that he or she has many skills and abilities, such as putting on clothes and shoes, playing with toys, such skills illustrate the child's growing sense of independence and autonomy. Erickson states that it is critical that parents allow their children to explore their limits of abilities within an encouraging environment which is tolerant of failure. For example, rather than putting on a child's clothes, a supportive parent should have the patience to allow the child to try until they succeed or ask for assistance. So, the parents need to encourage the child to become more independent, while at the same time protecting the child so that constant failure is avoided. A delicate balance is required for the parent. They must try not to do everything for the child, but if the child fails at a particular task, they shouldn't criticize the child for failure and accidents, particularly when toilet training the aim has to be self-control without a loss of self-esteem. Success in this stage will lead to the virtue of will. If children in this stage are encouraged and supported in their increased independence, they'll be more confident and secure in their own ability to survive in the world. If children are criticized, overly controlled, or not given the ability or opportunity to assert themselves, they begin to feel inadequate in their ability to survive, and may then become overly dependent on others, lack self-esteem, and feel a sense of shame or doubt in their own abilities. The third stage is initiative versus guilt. 
Around age three and continuing to age five, children assert themselves more frequently. These are particularly lively, rapid developing years in a child's life. According to B, it is a time of vigor or action and of behaviors that the parents may see as aggressive. During this period, the primary feature involves the child regularly interacting with other children at school. Central to this stage is play, as it provides children with the opportunity to explore their interpersonal skills through initiating activities. Children begin to plan activities, make up games, and initiate activities with others. If given this opportunity, children develop a sense of initiative and feel secure in their ability to lead others or make decisions. Conversely, if this tendency is squelched, either through criticism or control, children develop a sense of guilt. They may feel like a nuisance to others and will therefore remain followers, lacking in self-initiative. The child takes initiative which the parents will often try to stop in order to protect the child. The child will often overstep the mark in its forcefulness, and the danger is that the parents will tend to punish the child and restrict his initiatives too much. It is at this stage that the child will begin to ask many questions, as their thirst for knowledge grows. If the parents treat the child's questions as trivial, a nuisance, or embarrassing, or other aspects of their behavior as threatening, then the child may have feelings of guilt for being a nuisance. Too much guilt can make the child slow to interact with others, and may inhibit their creativity. Some guilt is sometimes necessary, otherwise the child would not know how to exercise self-control or to have a conscience. A healthy balance between initiative and guilt is important. Success in this stage will lead to the virtue of purpose. The next stage is industry or competence versus inferiority. Industry versus inferiority is the fourth stage of Erickson's theory of psychosocial development. This stage occurs during childhood between the ages of 5 and 12. Children are at the stage where they will be learning to read and write, to do sums, or to do things on their own. Teachers begin to take an important role in the child's life as they teach the child specific skills. It's at this stage that the child's peer group will gain greater significance and will become a major source for the child's self-esteem. The child now feels the need to win approval by demonstrating specific competencies that are valued by society, and begin to develop a sense of pride in their accomplishments. If children are encouraged and reinforced for their initiative, they begin to feel industrious and feel confident in their ability to reach goals. If this initiative is not encouraged, if it's restricted by parents or teachers, then the child begins to feel inferior, doubting his own abilities and therefore may not reach his or her potential. If the child can't develop the specific skills they feel society is demanding, such as being athletic or being smart, then they may develop a sense of inferiority. Some failure may be necessary so that the child can develop some modesty. Yet again, a balance between competency and modesty is necessary. Success in this stage will lead to the virtue of competence. The next stage is identity versus role confusion. This is the fifth stage, and it occurs during adolescence from about 12 to 18 years of age. During this stage, adolescents search for a sense of self and personal identity through an intense exploration of personal values, beliefs, and goals. Erickson says, The adolescent mind is essentially a mind or moratorium, a psychosocial stage between childhood and adulthood, and between the morality learned by the child and the ethics to be developed by the adult. During adolescence, the transition from childhood to adulthood is most important. Children are becoming more independent and begin to look at the future in terms of career, relationships, family, housing, etc. 
the individual wants to belong to society and fit in. This is a major stage in development where the child has to learn the roles he will occupy as an adult. It's during this stage that the adolescent will re-examine his identity and try to find out exactly who he or she is. Erickson suggests that two identities are involved, the sexual and the occupational. According to B, what should happen at the end of this stage is a reintegrated sense of self, of what one wants to do or be, and of one's appropriate sex role. During this stage, the body image of the adolescent changes. Erickson claims that the adolescent may feel uncomfortable about their body for a while until they can adapt and grow into the changes. Success in this stage will lead to the virtue of fidelity. Fidelity involves being able to commit oneself to others on the basis of accepting others, even when there may be ideological differences. During this period, they explore possibilities and begin to form their own identity based upon the outcome of their explorations. Failure to establish a sense of identity within society, such as, I don't know what I want to be when I grow up, can lead to role confusion. Role confusion involves the individual not being sure about themselves or their place in society. In response to role confusion or identity crisis, an adolescent may begin to experiment with different lifestyles in work, education, or political activities. Also, pressuring someone into an identity can result in rebellion in the form of establishing a negative identity, and in addition to this feeling of unhappiness. The next stage is intimacy versus isolation. Occurring in young adulthood, somewhere between 18 to 40 years of age, we begin to share ourselves more intimately with others. We explore relationships leading towards longer-term commitments with someone other than a family member. Successful completion of this stage can lead to comfortable relationships and a sense of commitment, safety, and care within a relationship. Avoiding intimacy Fearing commitment and relationships can lead to isolation, loneliness, and sometimes depression. Success in this stage will lead to the virtue of love. The next stage is generativity versus stagnation. During middle adulthood, somewhere between 40 to 65 years, we establish our careers, settle down within a relationship, begin our own families, and develop a sense of being a part of the bigger picture. We give back to society through raising our children, being productive at work, or becoming involved in community activities and organizations. By failing to achieve these objectives, we become stagnant or feel unproductive. Success in this stage will lead to the virtue of care. The final stage is called Ego Integrity versus Despair. As we grow older, above 65 years of age, and become senior citizens, we tend to slow down our productivity and explore life as a retired person. It's during this time that we contemplate our accomplishments and are able to develop integrity if we see ourselves as leading a successful life. Erickson believed that if we see our lives as unproductive, feel guilt about our past, or feel that we did not accomplish our life goals, we become dissatisfied with life and develop despair, often leading to depression and hopelessness. Success in this stage will lead to the virtue of wisdom. Wisdom enables a person to look back on their life with a sense of closure and completeness, and also accept death without fear. Erickson's theory has good face validity. Many people find that they can relate to his theories about various stages of the life cycle through their own experiences. However, Erickson is rather vague about the causes of development. What kinds of experiences must people have in order to successfully resolve various psychosocial conflicts and move on from one stage to another? The theory doesn't have a universal mechanism for crisis resolution. Indeed, 
Erickson acknowledges his theory is more a descriptive overview of human social and emotional development that doesn't adequately explain how or why this development occurs. For example, Erickson doesn't explicitly explain how the outcome of one psychosocial stage influences personality at a later stage. However, Erickson stresses his work was a tool to think with rather than a factual analysis. Its purpose, then, is to provide a framework within which development can be considered rather than testable theory. One of the strengths of Erickson's theory is the ability to tie together important psychosocial development across the entire lifespan. Although support for Erickson's stages of personality development exists, critics of his theory provide evidence suggesting a lack of discrete stages of personality development, which can often be the case. Life doesn't come chopped up in stages that we know we're entering into. We don't run across a finish line and then begin a new race. It doesn't feel that way to us or seem that way. These stages are often fluid, and sometimes they occur at different ages, varying from person to person. But it is an interesting and highly descriptive theory, nonetheless. The final psychologist that we're going to discuss today is Piaget. Now, you might notice that Piaget focuses not so much on the social or sexual aspects of development as the cognitive development. The Piaget stages of development are a blueprint that describe the stages of normal intellectual development from infancy through adulthood. This includes thought, judgment, and knowledge. The stages were named after psychologist and developmental biologist Jean Piaget, who recorded the intellectual development and abilities of infants, children, and teens. Piaget's four stages of intellectual or cognitive development are sensory motor, pre-operational, concrete, and formal. Piaget acknowledges, just like the other two psychologists, that some children may pass through the stages at different ages than the averages, and that some children may show characteristics of more than one stage at any given time. But he insisted that cognitive development always follows this sequence, that stages cannot be skipped, and that each stage is marked by new intellectual abilities and a more complex understanding of the world. During the early stage of sensory motor development, infants are only aware of what is immediately in front of them. They focus on what they see, what they're doing, and physical interactions within their immediate environment. Because they don't yet know how things react, they're constantly experimenting with activities such as shaking or throwing things, putting things in their mouth, and learning about the world through trial and error. The later stages include goal-oriented behavior which brings about a desired result. Between the ages of 7 and 9 months, infants begin to realize that an object exists even if it can no longer be seen. This important milestone, known as object permanence, is a sign that memory is developing. After infants start crawling, standing, and walking, their increased physical mobility leads to increased cognitive development. Near the end of this sensory motor stage, between 18 and 24 months, infants reach another important milestone, early language development, a sign that they are developing some symbolic abilities. During the preoperational stage, which occurs during toddler years through age 7, younger children are able to think about things symbolically. Their language use becomes more mature. They also develop memory and imagination, which allows them to understand the difference between past and future and engage in make-believe. But their thinking is based on intuition and still not completely logical. They cannot yet grasp more complex concepts such as cause and effect, time, or comparison. Next is the concrete operational stage. At this time, elementary age and pre-adolescent children, ages 7 to 11, demonstrate logical, concrete reasoning. 
children's thinking becomes less egocentric, and they are increasingly aware of external events. They begin to realize that one's own thoughts and feelings are unique and may not be shared by others or may not even be a part of reality. During this stage, however, most children still can't think abstractly or hypothetically. The next stage is formal operational stage. Adolescents who reach this fourth stage of intellectual development, usually at ages 11 and up, are able to logically use symbols related to abstract concepts, such as algebra and science. They can think about multiple variables in systematic ways, formulate hypotheses, and consider possibilities. They can also ponder abstract relationships and concepts such as justice. Although Piaget believed in lifelong intellectual development, he insisted that the formal operational stage is the final stage of cognitive development, and that continued intellectual development in adults depends on the accumulation of knowledge. So, there you have it, folks. Those are the three psychologists that have most greatly influenced how we view the development of people from children to adults. And notice they are all incredibly unique. Freud focused more on sexual development, Erickson on social development, and Piaget on cognitive development. Now, recall what I said earlier in the episode where we shouldn't take the thesis or the antithesis, but somewhere in the middle, the synthesis. No person is completely sexual or completely social or completely cognitive. We're all a mesh of those three aspects of our lives. And maybe those aren't even the entirety of the picture. But still, putting all three of these theories together gives us a more full image of how people develop. Some of you might be wondering, what happens if, say for instance, one of these stages is not fully completed? Well, in that scenario, a person might develop something like mental illness. That might happen even if all of the stages are completed, but there's too much external pressure. There's something happening in the environment that is making a person behave as if they were in a younger stage of development. So I have a clip here that I want to play for you describing mental illness and some of the sources that it might come from. Now, while this video focuses mostly on the genetic aspects of mental illness, notice that they do mention that Something that brings about mental illness is environmental stressors, and that's very important. So imagine how unhealthy a child might turn out if the environmental stressors are very strong around them. They might develop a mental illness and not reach a higher stage of sexual, cognitive, or social development. All right, well, here's the clip. I hope you all enjoy it. Hi, and welcome to Brain Cura. My name's Jake, and I'd like to talk today about mental illness, perhaps the most poorly understood set of diseases we know of. Statistics show that one in four adults will experience a mental illness at some point in their lives, and judging from the stigma that causes people to hide those conditions, and what those conditions actually involve, everything from to depression, to alcoholism, to eating disorders, I don't think it would be surprising if that number were actually a lot bigger. So if so many people have had or will have a mental illness, why is it so poorly understood and why is there such a stigma to it? The obvious reason is that other diseases are frequently visible and involve pain, something we can easily empathize with and even test. What goes on inside someone's head involves thoughts and emotions working off of one another and these cannot be directly observed. In order to have more empathy and understanding of those around us and even of ourselves, we need to take a look at what's going on inside sick brains, specifically the genes that control them. So, what causes mental illness? I 
First of all, there's a lot of mental disorders, and although there's a lot of overlap in those disorders, some of this information will not apply to all of them. For that reason, let's define the disorders we're looking at as hyper-effective or hyper-salient disorders. They involve uncontrollable moods, both good and bad, and seeing things as more significant, both threatening or rewarding, than they really are. Secondly, there is not just one gene or system that predisposes people to mental illness. For example, GABA is very likely involved, and the endorphin system could be at play as well. And if you saw my previous video, you know that the endocannabinoid system is another suspect in the epigenetics of mental illness. The most studied candidate gene is 5-HTTLPR, which has two variants, short and long. When combined with stress, those with one or two alleles that are short are more likely to suffer from a mental illness. The more stressful life events a person has, the more likely it is that they will develop depression, with people with long alleles being most resilient, people with one short allele faring worse, and people with two faring worst of all. One way this may work is short allele carriers don't avoid negative stimuli like long allele carriers do, meaning they could be more realistic, but less positive as a result. Also, bad moods last longer in those with the short allele, as it takes them more time to calm down and return to normal. Perhaps most frightening but convincing that 5-HTT-LPR is a very important gene in mental illness is the fact that suicide victims were much more likely to be a carrier of the short allele. The most studied effect of how 5-HTT-LPR causes these effects is how it influences the amygdala. The amygdala is the fight-or-flight center of the brain and helps assign emotional reactions to the things you experience in your life. What the short 5-HTT-LPR allele does is it increases the reactivity of the amygdala to emotional stimuli, and there are correlations between just how reactive the amygdala is and how depressed the person gets. This increased reaction and bias to threat likely causes anxiety, and anxiety can eventually lead to depression in some individuals. It's important to understand, though, that the short 5-HTT-LPR allele doesn't just increase emotional reactions to negative stimuli. It increases reactions to all emotional stimuli, good and bad. Short allele carriers reported bad parenting as worse than long allele carriers did, which you might find as expected. but. Shorts also saw good parenting as far better than longs did. This is why most mental illnesses can also be called hyper-effective. They have exaggerated emotional responses to the things and events that happen in their lives. Hyper-effectives get more anxious to stressful situations, and if enough of these stressful events happen, they can get depressed. Phobias can be easily explained. A woman who lost her amygdala also lost her fear to snakes and everything else for that matter. It certainly also seems to explain mania, as when good things happen to them, they feel extra good. They can feel so good with enough stimulation that it becomes overwhelming and even reckless. It's easy to look at hyperaffectivity and explain most of the disorders you can find in the DSM, likely due to the unique effective environment on those genes that predispose people to mental illness. But how does 5-HTT-LPR make the amygdala so reactive? One reason could be that the short allele carriers have smaller, more neuron-dense amygdala than others, but the real tell here is looking at what 5-HTT-LPR actually codes for, namely serotonin transporters. The short allele codes for less serotonin transporters, whereas the long one codes for more. With less serotonin transporters, more serotonin remains in the synaptic cleft and causes more serotonin signaling in the brain. It is this increased serotonin signaling that drives amygdala activity and trait anxiety. In this study, we see that 5-HTT-LPR is not the only gene that affects serotonin transmission rates, but so does HTR1A. HTR1A codes for serotonin autoreceptors that tell the sending neuron to stop releasing serotonin when they're activated, as to avoid uncontrolled excessive signaling. The C allele codes for fewer of these autoreceptors, and thus increases serotonin and anxiety. Another gene called TPH2 codes for tryptophan hydroxylase, which is an enzyme that helps make serotonin. T allele carriers produce more of the enzyme and therefore more serotonin, increasing how reactive the amygdala is to both negative and positive stimuli. This may seem counterintuitive to what a lot of people have heard about mood disorders and serotonin, but people with depression 
actually have more serotonin than those without. This study proved exactly that, which fits in perfectly with the hyperaffectivity model of mental illness. Here's another study that shows the opposite end of the equation. Low serotonin transmission actually protects people against anxiety. And in yet another study, scientists depleted serotonin and anorexics and found that it relaxed them. A really interesting study actually deleted the 5-HTT-LPR gene in mice, causing them to have no serotonin transporters at all, and found a lot of resulting symptoms that are shared by a lot of mental illnesses. This was their serotonin damning conclusion to that study. In summary, cert deficient mice constitute a behaviorally inhibited mouse, underexploratory, underactive, underaggressive, harm avoidant, and anxious. At the same time, they are oversensitive to mild to moderate stimulation with exaggerated neuroendocrine and behavioral responses, and they are liable to gut dysfunction, bone weakness, and substance abuse, including being alcohol and cocaine preferring. Thus, they represent a model for not just any one human genetic disease, but rather a single gene pleiotropy model for multiple comorbid complex disorders of modern Western civilization, all related to serotonin. In addition to mood and anxiety problems, high serotonin transmission can cause things like irritable bowel syndrome, shyness, tameness, excessive blushing, and even migraines, sexual health problems in both men and women, risk aversion, low social status, alcoholism, drug addiction, social awkwardness, and even social phobia. In conclusion, excessive serotonin, along with a few other neurotransmitter systems, causes amygdala hyperactivity, which causes hypersaliency and hyperaffectivity, which can then lead to a diagnosed mental illness, as well as other disorders of the body. Now you may be asking, if the mainstream conception about serotonin is completely flipped from reality, do antidepressants even work? That's the topic of the next video, where we'll look at the ways how psychiatric drugs both help and hurt, and what the drugs of the future may look like. All right, so there we have it. Mental illness. It can arise naturally through genetic influences, but the onset is largely based on external pressures. And hopefully, while you're developing while you're going through any one of these stages of psychological development, whether from Freud, Piaget, or Erickson, you didn't face too many stressors or obstacles that got in your way while you were moving from one stage to the next. And if you did, maybe it's time you focus on those flaws and try to solve them, figure them out, understand where they came from, and find a solution. I mean, I empathize. I understand that not everybody can control their mental illnesses, but sometimes there are things that we impose upon ourselves because we're tragically replaying some sort of trauma that has happened in the past. And what greater trauma could there be than stressors affecting you while you're trying to develop from a young child into an adept and skilled adult? Sometimes even the best of us deal with issues that are often related back to our young childhood experiences. And dealing with these is of the utmost importance if we want to realize the fullest potential that we all have within us. Well, that's all the time I have for you today. Thank you so much for listening to the Illumination Hour. It's been a really great run for the past several months of doing this show, and I hope to see you all again soon in the next season of the Illumination Hour. Have a great week, everyone. This is Ellen Stallone saying farewell until next time. Sorry, that was the wrong song. <laughs> and I don't mean to call you all Spanish ladies, but I do hope to see you all again soon. And this time I'm really saying farewell. It's just so hard to say goodbye, you know, but you've got to move on and let go and look forward to the future. 
And that's what we're going to do because life is about learning and illuminating those places of mystery that we haven't yet revealed. So I hope you all continue to do that in your lives and continue searching for answers. Carry on with your curiosity. 